Chapter 7, Part 3 of Aircraft and Submarines by Willis J. Abbott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by William Tomko. Some Methods of the War in the Air, Part 3. Some brief attention may here be given to the various types of anti-aircraft guns. These differ very materially in type and weight in the different belligerent armies and navies. They have but one quality in common, namely that they are most disappointing in the results attained. Mr. F. W. Lancaster, the foremost British authority on aircraft, says on the subject, Anti-aircraft flying is very inaccurate, hence number of guns are employed to compensate. That is to say that one or two guns can be little relied upon to put a flyer or du combat. The method adopted is to have large batteries which fairly fill the portion of the air through which the adventurous airman is making his way with shells fired rather at the section than at the swiftly moving target. Archibald, the British airmen call, for some mysterious reason, the anti-aircraft guns employed by their enemies sometimes referring to a big howitzer which made its appearance late in the war as Cuthbert. The name sound a little effeminate, redolent somehow of high teas and the dancing floor, rather than the field of battle. Perhaps this was why the British soldiers adopted them as an expression of contempt for the enemy's batteries. But contempt was hardly justifiable in face of the difficulty of the problem. A gun Firing a 20-pound shrapnel shell is not pointed on an object with the celerity with which a practiced revolver shot can throw his weapon into position. The gunner on the ground, seeing an airplane flying 5,000 feet above him, almost a mile up in the air, hurries to get his piece into position for a shot. But while he is aiming, the flyer, if a high-speed machine, will be changing its position at a rate of perhaps 120 miles an hour nor does it fly straight ahead the gunner cannot point his weapon some distance in advance as he would were he a sportsman intent on cutting off a flight of wild geese the aviator makes quick turns zigzags employs every artifice to defeat the aim of his enemy below small wonder that in the majority of cases they have been successful the attitude of the airman toward the archies is one of calm contempt the german mind being distinctly scientific invented early in the war a method of fixing the range and position of an enemy airplane which would be most effective if the target were not continually in erratic motion the method was to arrange anti-aircraft guns in a triangle all in telephonic connection with a central observer when a flyer enters a territory which these guns are guarding, the gunner at one of the apexes of the triangle fires a shell which gives out a red cloud of smoke Perhaps it falls short. The central observer notes the result and orders a second gun to fire. Instantly, a gunner at another apex fires again, this time a shell giving forth black smoke. This shell discharged with the warning given by the earlier one is likely to come nearer the target, but at any rate marks another point at which it has been missed. Between the two, a third gunner instantly corrects his aim by the results of the first two shots. His shell gives out a yellow smoke. The observer then figures from the positions of the three guns the lines of a triangular cone at the apex of which the target should be. Sometimes science wins, often enough for the Germans to cling to the system, but more often the shrewd aviator defeats science by his swift and eccentric changes of his line of flight. At the beginning of the war, Germany was very much better equipped with anti-aircraft guns than any of her enemies. This was due to the remarkable foresight of the great munition makers, Krupp and Erhardt, who began experimenting with anti-aircraft guns before the aircraft themselves were much more than experiments. The problem was no easy one. The gun had to be light, mobile, and often mounted on an automobile so as to be swiftly transferred from place to place in pursuit of raiders. It was vital that it should be so mounted as to be speedily trained to any position vertical or horizontal. As a result, the type determined upon was mounted on a pedestal fixed to the chassis of an automobile or to the deck of a ship in case it was to be used in naval warfare. The heaviest gun manufactured in Germany was of four and a quarter inch caliber, throwing a shell of 40 pounds weight. This could be mounted directly over the rear axle of a heavy motor truck. To protect the structure of the car from the shock 
of the recoil, these guns are of course equipped with hydraulic or other appliances for taking it up. They are manufactured also in a three-inch size. Germany, France, and England vied with each other in devising armored motor cars equipped with guns of this type, the British using the makes of Vickers and Hotchkiss, and the French their favorite, Crusoe. The trucks are always armored, the guns mounted in turrets, so that the effect is not unlike that of a small battleship dashing madly down a country road and firing repeatedly at some object directly overhead. But the record has not shown that the success of these picturesque and ponderous engines of war has been great. They cannot maneuver with enough swiftness to keep up with the gyrations of shots from below. Indeed, they so thoroughly demonstrated their inefficiency that before the war had passed its third year, they were either abandoned or their guns employed only when the car was stationary. Shots fired at full speed were seldom effective. The real measure of the effectiveness of an anti-aircraft gun may be judged by the comparative immunity that attended the aviators engaged on the two early British raids on Frederickshaven the seat of the great Zeppelin works on Lake Constance, and the German naval base at Cuxhaven. The first was undertaken by three machines. From Belfort in France, the aviators turned into Germany and flew for 120 miles across hostile territory. The flight was made by day, though indeed the adventurous aviators were favored by a slight mist. Small single-seated Avro machines were used, loaded heavily with bombs as well as with the large amount of fuel necessary for a flight which, before its completion, would extend over 250 miles, not only at the frontier, but at many fortified positions over which they passed, they must have exposed themselves to the fire of artillery, but until they actually reached the neighborhood of the Zeppelin works, they encountered no fire whatsoever. There the attack on them was savage and well maintained. On the roofs of the gigantic factory, on neighboring hillocks and points of vantage, there were anti-aircraft guns busily discharging shrapnel at the invaders. It is claimed by the British that fearing this attack, the Germans had called from the front in Flanders their best marksmen. For at that time, the comparative worthlessness of the Zeppelin had not been demonstrated, and the protection of the works was regarded as a prime duty of the army. The invading machines flew low above the factory roofs. The adventurers had come far on an errand which they knew would awaken the utmost enthusiasm among their fellows at home, and they were determined to so perform their task that no charge of having left anything undone could possibly lie. Commander Briggs, the first of the aviators to reach the scene, flew as low as 100 feet above the roofs, dropping his bombs with deadly accuracy. But he paid for his temerity with the loss of his machine and his liberty. A bullet pierced his petrol tank, and there was nothing for him to do save to glide to earth and surrender. The two aviators who accompanied him, although their machines were repeatedly hit, were nevertheless able to drop all their bombs and to fly safely back to Belfort whence they had taken their departure some hours before. The measure of actual damage done in the raid has never been precisely known. Germany always denied that it was serious. While the British ascribed to it the greatest importance, a clash of opinion common in the war, and which will for some years greatly perplex the student of its history. The second raid, that upon Cuxhaven, was made by seaplanes so far as the air fighting was concerned but in it not only destroyers but submarines also took part it presented the unique phenomenon of a battle fought at once above upon and below the surface of the sea it is with the aerial feature of the battle alone that we have to do christmas morning nineteen fifteen seven seaplanes were quietly lowered to the surface of the water of the north sea from their mother ships a little before daybreak the spot was within a few miles of Cuxhaven and the mouth of the river Elbe. As the aircraft rose from the surface of the water and out of the light mist that lay upon it, they could see the harbor which they threatened, a small group of German warships. Almost at the same moment, their presence was detected. The alarms of the bugles rang out from the hitherto quiet craft, and in a moment, with the smoke pouring from their funnels, destroyers and torpedo boats moved out to meet the attack. Two Zeppelins rose high in the air, surrounded by a number of the smaller planes eager for the conflict. The latter proceeded at once to the attack upon the raiding air fleet, while the destroyers, the heavier Zeppelins, and a number of submarines sped out to sea to attack the British ships.
The mist, which grew thicker, turned the combat from a battle into a mere disorderly raid. But out of it the seaplanes emerged unhurt. All made their way safely back to the fleet after having dropped their bombs with a degree of damage never precisely known. The weakness of the seaplane is that on returning to its parent ship it cannot usually light upon her deck, even though a landing platform has been provided. It must, as a rule, drop to the surface of the ocean, and if this be at all rough, the machine very speedily goes to pieces. This was the case with four of the seven seaplanes which took part on the raid on Cuxhaven. All, however, delivered their pilots safely to the awaiting fleet, and none fell a victim to the German anti-aircraft guns. In May of 1917, the British Royal Navy Air Service undertook the mapping of the coast of Belgium north from Newport, the most northerly seaport held by the British, to the southern boundary of Holland. This section of coast was held by the Germans, and in it were included the two submarine bases of Zeebrugge and Ostend. At the latter point, the long line of German trenches extending to the boundary of Switzerland rested its right flank on the sea. The whole coast north of that was lined with German batteries, snugly concealed in the rolling sand dunes and masked by the waving grasses of a barren coast. From British ships thirty miles out at sea, for the waters there are shallow and large vessels can only at great peril approach the shore, the seaplanes were launched. Just south of Newport, a land base was established as a rendezvous for both air and seaplanes when their day's work was done. From fleet and station, the aerial observers took their way daily to the enemy's coast. Every mile of it was photographed. The hidden batteries were detected and the inexorable record of their presence imprinted on the films. The work in progress at Ostend and Zeebrugge, the active construction of basins, locks, and quays, the progress of the great mole building at the latter port, the activities of submarines and destroyers within the harbor, the locations of guns, and the positions of barracks were all indelibly set down. These films developed at leisure were made into coherent holes, placed in projecting machines, and displayed like moving pictures in the ward rooms of the ships hovering offshore, so that the naval forces preparing for the assault had a very accurate idea of the nature of the defenses they were about to encounter. This was not done, of course, without considerable savage fighting in midair. The Germans had no idea of allowing their defenses and the works of their submarine bases to be pictured for the guidance of their foes. Their anti-aircraft guns barked from dawn to dark whenever a British plane was seen within range. Their own aerial fighters were continually busy, and along that desolate, wave-washed coast, many a lost lad in leather clothing and goggles, crumpled up in the ruins of his machine after a fall of thousands of feet, lay as a memorial to the prowess of the defenders of the coast and the audacity of those who sought to invade it. But during the long weeks of this extended reconnaissance, hardly a spadeful of dirt could be moved a square yard of concrete placed in position, or a submarine or torpedo boat maneuvered without its record being entered upon the detailed charts the British were so painstakingly preparing against the day of assault. When peace shall finally permit the publication of the records of the war, now held secret for military reasons, such maps as those prepared by the British Air Service on the Belgian coast will prove most convincing evidence of the military value of the aerial scouts. What the lads engaged in making these records had to brave in the way of physical danger is strikingly shown by the description of a combat included in one of the coldly matter-of-fact official reports. The battle was fought at about 12,000 feet above Mother Earth. We quote the official description accompanied by some explanatory comments added by one who was an eyewitness and who conversed with a triumphant young airman on his return to the safety of the soil. While exposing six plates, says the official report of this youthful recording angel, I observed five HAs cruising. HA stands for Hostile Aeroplane. Not having seen the escort since returning inland, the pilot prepared to return. The enemy separated, one taking up a position above the tail and one ahead. The other three glided toward us on the port side, firing as they came. The two diving machines fired over 100 rounds, hitting the pilot in the shoulder. As a matter of fact, the bullet entered his shoulder from above, behind, breaking his left collarbone, and emerged just above his heart, tearing a jagged rent down his breast. 
Both his feet, furthermore, were pierced by bullets, but the observer is not concerned with petty detail. The observer held his fire until H.A., diving on tail, was within five yards. Here it might be mentioned that the machines were hurtling through space at a speed in the region of 100 miles an hour. The pilot of H.A., having swooped to within speaking distance, pushed up his goggles and laughed triumphantly as he took sight for the shot that was to end the fight. But the observer had his own idea how the fight should end. I then shot one tray into the enemy's pilot's face, he says, with curt relish, and watched him side-slip and go spinning earthward in a train of smoke. He then turned his attention to his own pilot. The British machine was barely under control, but as the observer rose in his seat to investigate the foremost gun was fired, and the aggressor ahead went out of control and dived nose-first in helpless spirals. Suspecting that his mate was badly wounded, in spite of this achievement, the observer swung one leg over the side of the fuselage and climbed onto the wing, figure for a minute the air pressure on his body during this gymnastic feat, until he was beside the pilot faint and drenched with blood, who had nevertheless got his machine back into complete control. "'Go back, you ass,' he said through white lips, in response to inquiries how he felt. So the ass got back the way he came, and looked around for the remainder of the H.A.s. These, however, appeared to have lost stomach for further fighting, and fled. The riddled machine returned home at one hundred knots, while the observer, having nothing better to do, continued to take photographs. The pilot, though wounded, made a perfect landing. Thus the report concludes. When the time came for the assault upon Zeebrugge, the value of these painstaking preparations was made evident. The attack was made from sea and air alike. Out in the North Sea, the great British battleships steamed in as near the coast as the shallowness of the water would permit. From the forward deck of each rose grandly a seaplane until the air was darkened by their wings and they looked like a monstrous flock of the gulls which passengers on ocean-going liners watch wheeling and soaring around the ship as it plows its way through the ocean. These gulls, though, were birds of prey. They were planes of the larger type, biplanes or triplanes carrying two men, usually equipped with two motors and heavily laden with high explosive bombs. As they made their way toward the land, they were accompanied by a fleet of high draft monitors, especially built for the service, each mounting two heavy guns and able to maneuver in shallow water. With them advancing, a swarm of swift, low-flying, dark-painted destroyers ready to watch out for enemy torpedo boats or submarines. They mounted anti-aircraft guns, too, and were prepared to defend the monitors against assaults from the heavens above, as well as from the sinister attack of the underwater boats. Up from the land, base at Newport, came a great fleet of airplanes to cooperate with their naval brethren. Soon upon the German works, sheltering squadrons of the sinister undersea boats, there rained a hell of exploding projectiles from the sea and sky. Every gunner had absolute knowledge of the precise position and range of the target to which he was assigned. The great guns of the monitors roared steadily, and their twelve- and fourteen-inch projectiles rent in pieces the bomb-proofs of the Germans, driving the Bosches to cover and reducing their works to mere heaps of battered concrete. Back and forth above flew seaplanes and airplanes, giving battle to the aircraft which the Germans sent up in the forlorn hope of heading off that attack and dropping their bombs on points carefully mapped long in advance. It is true that the aim of the aviators was necessarily inaccurate. That is the chief weakness of a bombardment from the sky. But what was lacking in individual accuracy was made up by the numbers of the bombing craft. One might miss a lock or a shelter, but twenty concentrating their fire on the same target could not all fail. This has become the accepted principle of aerial offensive warfare. The inaccuracy of the individual must be corrected by the multiplication of the number of the assailants. The attack on Zeebrugge was wholly successful, though the Germans assiduously strove to conceal the damage done. The later observations of the ruined port by British airmen left no doubt that as a submarine base it had been put out of commission for months to come. The success of the attack led to serious discussion, in which a determination has not yet been reached of the feasibility of a similar assault upon Heligoland, Kiel, or Cuxhaven, the three great naval bases in which the German fleet has lurked in avoidance of battle with the British fleet. 
many able naval strategists declared that it was time for the British to abandon the policy of a mere blockade and carry out the somewhat rash promise made by Winston Churchill when First Lord of the Admiralty to dig the rats out of their holes. Such an attack, it was urged, should be made mainly from the air, as the land batteries and sunken mines made the waters adjacent to these harbors almost impassable to attacking ships. Rear Admiral Fisk of the United States Navy, strongly urging such an attack, wrote in an open letter, The German Naval General Staff realizes the value of concentration of power and mobility in as large units as possible. The torpedo plane embodies a greater concentration of power and mobility than does any other mechanism. For its cost, the torpedo plane is the most powerful and mobile weapon which exists at the present day. An attack by Allied torpedo planes, armed with guns to defend themselves from fighting airplanes, would be a powerful menace to the German fleet and, if made in sufficient numbers, would give the Allies such unrestricted command of the North Sea, even of the shallow parts near the German coast, that German submarines would be prevented from coming from a German port, the submarine menace abolished, and all chance of German success wiped out. I beg also to point out that an inspection of the map of Europe shows that in the air raids over land the strategical advantage lies with Germany because their most important towns like berlin are farther inland than the most important towns of the allies like london so that aeroplanes of the allies in order to reach berlin would have to fly over greater distances while exposed to the fire of other aeroplanes than do aeroplanes of the germans in going to london for raids on naval vessels however the strategical advantage over water lies with the british because their control of the deep parts of the North Sea enables them to establish a temporary aeronautical base of motherships sufficiently close to the German fleet to enable the British to launch a torpedo plane attack from it on the German fleets in Kiel and Wilhelmshaven. While the Germans could not possibly establish an aeronautical base sufficiently close to the British fleet, this gives the Allies the greatest advantage of the offensive. It would seem possible, provided a distinct effort is made, for the Allies to send a large number of aeroplane motherships to a point, say, 50 miles west of Heligoland, and for a large force of fighting aeroplanes and torpedo planes to start from this place about two hours before dawn, reach Kiel Bay and Wilhelmshaven about dawn, attack the German fleets there, and sink the German ships. The distance from Heligoland to Kiel is about 90 land miles, and to Wilhelmshaven about 45. The torpedo planes referred to are an invention of Admiral Fisk's, which, in accordance with what seems to be a fixed and fatal precedent in the United States, has been ignored by our own authorities, but eagerly adopted by the naval services of practically all the belligerents. One weakness of the aerial attack upon ships of war is that the bombs dropped from the air, even if they strike the target, strike upon the protective deck, which in most warships above the gunboat class is strong enough to resist, or at least to minimize, the effect of any bomb capable of being carried by an airplane. The real vulnerable part of a ship of war is the thin skin of its hull below water and below the armor belt. This is the point at which the torpedo strikes. Admiral Fisk's device permits an aeroplane to carry two torpedoes of the regular Whitehead class and to launch them with such an impetus and at such an angle that they will take the water and continue their course thereunder exactly as though launched from a naval torpedo tube. His idea was adopted both by Great Britain and Germany. British torpedo planes thus equipped sank four Turkish ships in the Sea of Marmora a field of action which no British ship could have reached after the disastrous failure to force the Dardanelles. The Germans, by employment of the same device, sank at least two Russian ships in the Baltic and one British vessel in the North Sea. The blindness of the United States naval authorities to the merits of this invention was a matter arousing at once curiosity and indignation among observers during the early days of our entrance upon the war. End of some Methods of the War in the Air, Part 3 Recording by William Tomko